Oh, been, oh, recorded. Okay. Uh, should I hit continue or you will do it? No, I would, I'd like to introduce Abraham Garcia, everybody. He is a uh, doctor of audiology. Uh, he lives in Asuncion, Paraguay. Um, as you can see here, he's the American Institute of Balance Global Ambassador. Uh, he's a vestibular fellow from the AIB International. Uh, he got his doctorate in the United States. Um, so he's an American trained audiologist uh, living in Asuncion, Paraguay. He's, uh, I've uh, known him for probably three, four years. Um, and uh, my experience in, in working with him has been nothing more than positive. Um, as a matter of fact, since I wear hearing aids, because uh, I had sudden deafness in my right ear almost three years ago, um, he's helped me out when I've been in Paraguay with some, uh, uh, you know, uh, assistance in tuning up my hearing aids to the most uh, beneficial uh, parameters that I can uh, get out through them. So with nothing more said, uh, Dr. Abraham Garcia, Asuncion Paraguay, will share his knowledge uh, with us today. Uh, Abraham, it's your, it's your platform. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Abraham. And today we are going to talk about the peripheral vestibular system. We are doing some very basics. So the goal for today's lecture is for you guys to expand your knowledge and use everything that we talk today in your clinic right away. So from the get-go, we need to talk about the equilibrium. When we talk about equilibrium or balance, we are talking about an integration of the inner ear, your visual and your somatosensory external inputs. All of them are mixed with the cerebellum. So the motor res response is responsible for the cen central cortex. So every time that a patient will have a stroke, we always need to think about which side the stroke affects and where. So let's focus on the vestibular system. As we know, they have five organs, three semicircular canals, the utricle and the sacule. Now, when we talk about the vestibular system, we need to only focus that the system have only two jobs, velocity and gravity, velocity and gravity. Abraham, just one second. I don't, your, your slideshow's not moving for me. There? The slideshow's not working. Did it move now? No, it's frozen. What about there? No, I'm, I'm frozen. Uh, anybody else see the slideshow moving? No, no, it's frozen. It's frozen, okay. No. Mm. Let me try this. Be recorded, continue, fine. What about yeah, that? You, we're good yes. now, thank you very much. We're good now? Yes. Let me try it again. What about, did it move now? Uh, no, we're still on the same slide showing the vestibule and semicircular canals. And Maybe you, you had to select your slide by hand. Probably. Well, I will no. not use this one. I will use this one. What about there? No. No? No. It's showing there? We see the vestibular system again. Go back to what the... What about... Is there? Yes, you yeah. the next one? Okay, I, I will use this way. It's not the ones presenting the whole thing, but well, this is what I got. Okay, fine, go ahead. Okay, so going back to the vestibular system, we we're talking about the semicircular canals, the utricle and the sacule. Now the semicircular canals, those detect the angular head movement. Which movement does detect? The pitch movement, the yaw movement, and the roll movement. Which movement are those? Pitch, up and down, yaw, like a no, and the roll, side to side. The utricle and the sacule, they detect the, they detect the linear acceleration. What does it mean, linear acceleration? Meaning where the body or the head move forward or backward. That's linear acceleration or sideways, but always in a linear way. Pretty much we need to remember the semicircular canal detects the gravity of the head because of the pitch, yaw, and the roll plane. And the usual and cycle detects pretty much acceleration, the speed of the movement. The innervation of each organ 
is the superior branch of the vestibular nerve innervates to the anterior, horizontal, and utricle. Very important when we are diagnosing what's going on with the patient. And the inferior innervates to the sacral and the posterior. Each one of them will create a specific type of nystagmus and a specific type of response from the patient. So when we have a patient at the clinic, we need to know and differentiate if the patient has a dizziness, vertigo, like headaches, or an imbalance issue. Because most of the time, we have patients that come to us and say, hey, doctor, I get dizzy. I get dizzy, 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 dizzy. When in all reality, we need to know that according to the Bahraini Society, the American Balance Society and the American Academy of Audiology with the NHS from UK, they got a consensus saying that dizziness is an internal feeling of room spinning, meaning we can feel that things are moving inside our head. Now, vertigo is a hallucination of movement. What does it mean? We can see things moving. The patient will say, I see that the, the table or the ceiling is moving like a fan, turning around, but we can see it. Now, lightheadedness is an off feeling. Like they feel like about to faint, but they don't faint. And imbalance is pretty much when they're off while moving. Like they feel like they're walking like a drunk person, but lightheadedness, they feel like a drunk person. Those different we need to really know as the first question we're asking the patient, what's going on today? Why are you visiting me? Once we know if it's a DC issue or a vertigo issue, we want to go more into details. We, we like to start with vertigo patients or DC patients. We want to start with questions about the vestibule. We want to know if this issue is episodic or is constant. If this issue is provoking by a static, dynamic, or positional provoke, what does it mean? Meaning like if you sit still, do you feel dizzy? Or things are moving? Or patients say yes or no? Or do you feel dizzy when you're walking around, like in a grocery store, looking for, for the table, looking for the tomato paste? Or you only get dizzy when you change position, like you lay flat, roll in bed, or look up or down. Another thing that we want to know is the time. How long does it last? It lasts hours, weeks, minutes, seconds. Are you completely free after an event? Or there's anything that you can do to stop? Things also we need to remember to ask if it's the darkness, does it make it better or worse? If you're walking or turning, does it make it better or worse? And we will feel oscillopsia. Oscillopsia means like things in our vision is like shaky, but it stops. Always have to stop. Those are questions that we know that is related to the vestibule system. And we need to like pretty much like match, like making a draw that what's going on, so better know, because we know that the system is velocity and gravity. It's always velocity and gravity. And each one of the questions will tell us what pathology is going on with the patient. Another thing that we want to know is about the auditory system. Do we have a hearing loss? Do we have ringing in the ears? Do we, have, do we feel the ears blocked? Does the ear hurt, pain, otasia, discharge from the ears? Now, all of these symptoms, we really want to know if it happened before, after, or happened way before these symptoms. A common mistake that we see every day at the clinic, we have a patient coming in with a diagnosis of veneer disease. I say, how did you get diagnosed? Oh, I told my patient that I don't hear right, I get ringing in my ear, and I got dizzy. When we go into details, and ask it when, they tell, oh, I got my hearing loss about 20 years ago. And I can ring it in the ears about 10 years ago. Well, hearing loss always have ringing in the ears or tinnitus as a symptom. And they ask you, oh, when did the vertigo, the dizziness start? Did it start actually three days ago? Those are unrelated events. So we need to be very careful with the onset of each symptoms. They have to be related. Or the things that we, not, we want to know the comorbidities, neurologic comorbidities, cardiovascular, cervical, bacterial, medication that the patient is taking. Is the patient having numbness? They had a stroke, a TIA. They see dark floaters. Dark floaters are related to a neurological event. Or they see sparkles like flashing lights when they're standing up. Those are related to cardiovascular event or to static event. They feel like fainting, they feel like off. If it's related to the cervical patient, we say, oh, I have a pain right here in the neck. I cannot turn my head. 
or I feel my stiff, very stiff, very hard. If it's bacterial, people say, oh yeah, I got shingles about five months ago. Or oh, I have a Bell's palsy. I have numbness on my face. I don't feel this side. But it was a bacterial related. Why? Because the bacteria or the viral, it can be always sleep on a stain on the vestibular branch of the nerve. Especially like shingles, that's herpes, sobsters, they like to sleep on the inferior branch. So we can expect to see this patient with a spontaneous nystagmus that is related. If it's the patient also present with a Bell's palsy, a numbness of the face on one side, plus a hearing loss, plus vertigo, they all happen within a week, we can suspect of a ramsen hunt syndrome. And the treatment for that is very different from an uncompens uncompensated vestibulopathy by itself. Now, when we want to go and assess the system, we need to remember that the system has three reflex, the vestibular ocular reflex, the cervical colic reflex, and the spinal reflex. Let's start with the vestibular ocular reflex. The vestibular ocular reflex is where we will see like a spontaneous nystagmus. Now, when we're assessing those, we want to use either a VOG or a VNG, a vestibular uh, vesti video nystagmography, something like this. Pretty simple. Doesn't have to be a fancy one. Why? Because what this does pretty much, let me turn mine on so I can show you guys. Like this, it enhances your eyes. So you can see in the dark, what, how is the eyes behaving? Is the nystagmus spontaneous? Yes or no? It can fix it? Yes or no? Then you want to know in a st static portion and then in a dynamic portion. How do we add dynamic then? With the video goggles, just shake the head. It can be either seated or lateral. So we can provoke even a stronger response. The next test that we can also use for the vestibular ocular reflex is the VAT or the snail chart. The snail chart is the one that the ophthalmology uses. Pretty much you have the patient seated in front of the chart about two meters away and ask the patient, okay, read the lines, E, F, G, O, P, M, and then you write down until what line they can see. Then you add velocity, because remember it's velocity and gravity. You add velocity and turn it and ask the patient to read again. What are we looking there? We're looking for oscillopsia. The next test that we can use that we don't need to have a fancy equipment is the head thrust. Dr. Hunmaji, pretty much look at the nose of the, of the physician, the patient look at the nose, physician grab the head, and start tuning the head, asking the patient to fix it, the eyes and the nose. When we have a vestibular event, we will see that when we are moving back and forth and we shake it fast, we'll see that the eyes will drift. According to the side that is drifting, we can start to ask, oh, there might be a vestibulopathy, an uncompensated one. Another, another test that we also perform is the caloric test and the active and passive test. The active and passive tests are the tests when you use the body of the patient and you either lay flat on the side or upward, supine position. Now, when we are testing about the vestibular ocular reflex and we talk about velocity, we need to remember the type of velocity that we test with each part of the test. Like everybody says, oh, let's do caloric, 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 caloric. Well, caloric is a very low frequency test. I mean, it's a very, very slow movement that we're looking for. Rotary chair is a mid to low frequency between 0.5 and 1 hertz. What does it mean? In a single chair, for example, what would be the, the comparison to a caloric chair testing? It's a movement about this speed. No slow, no fast. The swap is a little bit faster. Now, when we want to test a high frequency because we live in a high frequency environment, we have the B head, we have the head thrust, the head shake, and the bat. What is a high frequency? Pretty much when we go to the grocery store and we are looking for the bread. What do we do? We walk forward and then we do this. Fast. That movement right there, that was two frequency, about two frequency, two hertz. Now, a very high frequency, we are going to also perform. This one we use a school vibrator. We pretty much have to have a video goggles, a VNG. We have to have a vibrator. We place on the school. We choose the frequency and we shake it. And we expect to see a specific type of nystagmus according to the frequency that we do. That's a very high frequency. When we go into the vestibular colic reflex, we have here the vestibular evoked myogenic potentials. We have the ocular and the cervical. The ocular.
where we are testing the superior nerve branch and the utricle. The cervical, we're using the sacral and the inferior. Unfortunately, for this one, we need to have the system. We need to have it. Another, another thing that we can do to test the vestibular colic reflex or vestibular cervical reflex, we can do what they call the VAS test. It's a very simple test. They have multiple use. One of the use that we have with this test is we check the uh, range of motion of the neck and we check for the proprioception uh, with the embedded into the vestibular nuclei test. How simple, turn the head to the side and look up. If it's neck related, the patient will get dizzy in this position right here. Or we'll see, actually we'll see blur, double, they have numbness, pain, radiculopathy. They will have all those symptoms. Those are neck related symptoms. They can also make the person dizzy. The last but not least, the vestibular spinal reflex. Here we have a, a wide array of tests that we can perform. We can do the postural stability test, the Fakura test, the sensory integration test, the GANS SOP test, the dynamic gait index test, and the computer, computerized dynamic posturography test. All those tests are telling us about the integration of the three sense, eyes, ears, and proprioception, your feet, in relation to the cerebellum. Very important, this portion of the reflex when we have a patient that just had a stroke or a TIA. They got diagnosed about three weeks ago, five, months, five weeks ago, and now they start to have some dizzy symptoms. It could be related. So we want to assess each one of them separately. Now, 75 to 81% of your patients in an everyday clinic will have a BPPV, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Now, for this one, we want to assess the canals, the semicircular canals. We have a posterior, horizontal, anterior canal, three on each ear. So as we know, the canals detect the gravity, our gravity detector in relation to the head position. Why? We talk about up and down, that's anterior, side to side, that's horizontal, and the posterior will be the rolling. The most easy way to perform for testing for posterior canal is the Dix Hall Pike. That's the one that all we know, laying the person flat with the head turned. Everybody knows that one. That one, I would personally like to use a variation called the sideline. When I lay the person on their side, not on their back, with the head turned. The head is turned away from the tested ear. Now, for horizontal canal, we have a different ways to assess. We have the sideline for whole pipe, where you keep the head straight, just lay on the side. We have the Pagnani Maglure, the bow and lean. Personally, Pagnani Maglure don't like it very much because 90% of the patient will have a neck discomfort, neck issue, because they are 65 and above. They cannot turn the head very well for that one. We now have to lay flat and then turn the head. Turn the head to be up to 90 degrees. People don't turn the head 90 degrees. If you do it, you will hurt your patient. For anterior canal, this is a deep head hanging. Unfortunately, this one, we don't have a lot of variations. This one has to lay flat on the, on the table and then hang the head deeply. That's for anterior canal. And then there's another maneuver they just, just developed, 2019, called the CAN. It's the Cursa All Canal Maneuver. This is treated for a BBBB in any canal. I will show you a video later. Now, some illustration about treatments. For anterior canal, as I was telling you before, we have position one, where, uh, there you go, you have the person seated, straight. Position two, you lay the person flat with the head hanging. The issue here, your neck range of motion has to be pretty good, otherwise you have to do some small variations. Position three, you raise the head 30 degrees, and then position four, you have to just ask the patient to sit back on the position one. Very straightforward for anterior canal VPPV. Now, when we went to horizontal Do canal, doctor, we have different... Dr. Abraham. Yes. How, how long do you uh, leave your patient in each position? For anterior canal, we want to leave about 30 seconds. For anterior canal, oh, let's go here. For anterior canal, we will see nystagmus. We always expect to see nystagmus. So two things. One, we wait until nystagmus is gone. 
Two, we ask the patient if they see things moving, because you may have no nystagmus, but you still might have the perception of movement. Perception of movements is related to what we call subclinical VPPV. Not enough debris in the canal to create the movement of the eye, but enough for the patient to see and feel. For horizontal, for anterior, usually about 30 seconds. 30 seconds to 40 seconds. Pretty fast, pretty quick. That's how much we wait. Now moving forward, for horizontal canal. Horizontal canal, position one, as you can tell right here, this is position one, you play on the side. This is what they call sidelined. Now, the only thing that I don't like about this picture is the head. The head has to be 30 degrees up from this position, a little bit higher, 30 degrees. Why? Because we need to remember that horizontal canal naturally is 30 degrees like this, but lower. So when we raise the head forward, we are putting it in a straight position. Position two, turn the, turn the body flat, up, going like supine position, the head always keeping 30 degrees. Position three to the other side, position four, you sit it back and head down. This is what they call the barbecue roll on the log test. A different, a different treatment that people can do is the Panini, is the Gufoni, Cassani, or Apiani. This one is one of the like the most. Why? Because you lay the patient on your side, you expect to see of an nystagmus. Either it can be geotropic or ageotropic. What does it mean, A or geo? It only means that the nystagmus is beating towards the ground or away from the ground. Towards the ground, towards the center, geo, that's geotropic. Away means ageotropic. Ageotropic, then we do what we call the Panini, Cassani, Gufoni. Actually, Dr. Sumamaya, they, he just came about three years ago, he just came with a treatment for ageotropic nystagmus. The only issue with his treatment is when you turn the head, it's laying sideline, like it's showing right here, position one. Position two, you turn up. Position three, you have to turn the head all the way to the other side. The only issue with this maneuver, you have to have a patient with a very good neck range of motion. Otherwise, you can hurt your patient's neck. Now, Another development that they have not too long ago, it was the cursed hybrid. For this one, I actually have a video. I, I asked for the Dr. Kurtzer and he sent me a link to the video. So let me see if I can share my screen with you guys so you can see the video. Can you see the video here? Oh, wait. Let me stop this one and open a new one so you can see the video that I want you to show. This one here. Actually, it's on the internet. Somebody just uploaded it not too long ago. I think it was three days ago. Oh, actually, yeah, April 16, 2020. Now, this one, you start, as you can, as you can see, with the head. Oh, let me, wait, doesn't move. Okay. Turn to the opposite side. You can expect to see an nystagmus right there. Let me, up oh, there. So I can explain you at the same time as I want. Oh, there you go. You wait about 60 seconds at each position. You can expect to see nystagmus on each position. One, the 60 seconds off is gone. Step two, you turn the head all the way down. As you can tell, if you can see the head is tucked inward, 30 degrees angle, always to keep the canal horizontal. Again, 60 seconds at minimum. Or you can ask your patient to still feel dizzy. Once the 60 seconds is up, let me see here. Oh, internet connection issues. Okay. You have to turn the patient's head. Let me go a little faster. Upward again, all the way. You have to keep the head at 30 degree angle and you ask your patient to rotate to the opposite side. This is for horizontal canal. In this position, you repeat it again. 60 seconds up. Again, you hold it for 60 seconds. You look for nystagmus. You ask your patient if they see things moving. You ask your patient how they're feeling. Usually, they should be pretty good. Turn the head down again, 30 degrees angle. Tuck the chin down, asking your patient to touch their chin to their chest. Again, 60 seconds, 
once the 16 seconds is over let me go a little faster over here once the 60 seconds is over you ask the patient to put the head in neutral position once your patient is in neutral position you check for the eyes movement is atrophic does it have a geotropic nystagmus if nothing's going on you ask your patient to sit up pretty simple pretty straightforward everybody can do it no, nothing out of the world now when we go let me switch my screens again for a second let me do it again here oh there we go now when we go on the posterior canal about 80 percent of the patient will have a vppv on the posterior canal for the posterior canal we have the classic the airplane maneuver everybody hears about this one everybody knows about this one now the american association of of physical therapists they actually made a statement saying to be careful with this maneuver why if you can see position one here right here you have to have the patient to look up 45 degrees now position two you ask the patient to turn the head and lay back when they lay back with the head 45 degrees up you are overextending the head, putting a lot of pressure on the neck. If your patient have a neck issue, either arthritis, arthrosis, have any herniated disc, you are risking to have a stroke or you're risking to have a dissection of the vertebral artery on the neck. That would be very, very common when performing this test or performing this maneuver. That's why me personally, how I per, I will, I like better a different type of maneuver for posterior canal. I will show you again. Let me stop again my slides. I, pref I prefer, I actually prefer, where is it? This one here. I prefer this one. I will show you guys now. I prefer this one. I prefer the Sumont liberatory maneuver. There you go. I will play the video for you. If we are testing, for example, the right ear, right PC, you have to ask your patient to uh, turn their head away from the tested ear, like you show in this short video. Turn the head away from the tested ear. You lay it on the side, support the head. You look for nystagmus. You wait until nystagmus is gone. Again, about 20 to 30 seconds. One is gone. You will prepare the patient because you have to sit the patient up and then lay it on the opposite side. It's gone. You have the patient. You always have to help your patient. Never leave them alone. You sit it up and you lay flat on the other side, head down, forehead touching your bed, always. Once it's there, you do the liberatory maneuver. We shake in the head. That's the liberatory portion. Once the nystagmus is gone, everything's finished, no more dizzy feeling, you sit your patient up. Always help your patient and sit it up, head straight, but looking down. So we reassure that all the debris is back in the utricle portion. Once it's gone, you hold your patient, look forward, you hold your patient because of possible to mark in crisis. You want to avoid that, be very careful with that. Another maneuver, that I like to use a lot, we can all use it, it's very safe, is the GANS repositioning maneuver. The GANS repositioning maneuver it starts like the Sumont maneuver. I'll show you in the video. Start exactly the same way, you turn your head away from the affected ear, the one we think that is affected, you lay it on the side, but for this maneuver, you have to go around your patient all the way to the back of the patient. I'll show you in a second. Once the vertigo then nystagmus stops patient doesn't feel vertigo anymore you can just leave your patient always keep one hand on the patient and then you turn your patient all the way to the opposite side like it show you right here all the way like that you always keep your patient with touching with your hands just to reassure your patient you shake the head that's a liberatory portion for any possible debris to avoid any canalic jam the patient feels better, don't feel dizzy anymore. You control for a couple of seconds. Once it's done, you seated your patient again. Once you seated, just as before, 
you help your patient, you sit it, and ask the patient to look down again, just to reassure that all the debris is back in the utricle. Once it's back, very careful, you check for nystagmus, no nystagmus, voila, you're done. That's a very simple one. This one you can perform with a small table. You don't have to have a big table. Anybody can perform it. You only have to always tell your patient what are you doing before you do it so the patient can help you. Those are those what you need. Now, I would like to share with you guys something new. This is from um, 2000, last year. The Dr. Kurzer with another neurologist back in Florida, they just developed a new maneuver that is supposed to treat all the canals at once. They call it the CAN maneuver. It's a combination of different treatments at once. So you start with a modified epile. That's why he use a, a pillow or you cast a bosu ball. You choose the side that you're doing it. In this case, he's doing the right ear. To lay flat, turn your head to the right. Here we have your right PC and the left anterior canal. You turn the head to the opposite side. You always check for the neck range of motion. Here we're checking for the left posterior canal and for the right anterior canal. Then we have to turn your patient, just like in an epilim maneuver, on their side. Here we're doing the left posterior, the right anterior. Once it's on that position, we wait until the nystagmus of the DC feeling is gone. Once it's gone, okay, we move all the way flat down with the head turned. Here, what are we doing? We are doing the right posterior again and the left anterior. From this position, once the nystagmus is gone, we go back a little, just like we do in a barbecue roll, we raise the head up. This is what's supposed to be the final for the barbecue roll. But then again, he added an extra roll. Here's the cursed hybrid. We head up. This is for the horizontal canal. The horizontal canal. But to treat it, you go down again. This one you can do all at once. It's supposed to treat all the canal at once. We are treating the posterior canal, the anterior canal, and the horizontal canal. If you can see, this last portion is pretty similar to the cursed hybrid. And then just to recheck on the horizontal, you want to do the contralateral side. Just to recheck, just in case you are in front of a canal atiasis or cupid atiasis, because you will not know. Usually you know for the degree of the nystagmus, if you don't have the equipment, you only will know that the patient is very, very dizzy. Once you are done with the recheck, you ask your patient to sit back, always helping your patient, never leave your patient alone, and that's it. That should take care of all the canals at once. That was the, but he's actually right now, he told me that he's under review. So he's supposed to be done by the end of the year to actually publish this new maneuver. Now, do you guys have any questions? How do I? Richard? I can't hear you guys. Uh, oh, doctor, you okay, when, you, okay. when okay. you perform the VAS test, Will you yes. assess uh, uh, at the same time if there is any uh, artery compression in the neck, vertebral yes. artery, or basilar artery, I think? Actually, what we are assessing is the vertebral, vertebral artery when we're doing the VAS test. What we are assessing is for a compression of the artery. As we know, between the C2 and C1, the artery that goes in between the bone goes outside. A lot of time with any herniated disc, any protrusion, or a lot of stiffening of the muscle, when we turn our head or look up to reach a plate, 
we can compress on the artery. That's when we will have a feeling of either dizziness, fainting, blur vision, double vision, nausea. We can also have some ringing in the ears, some tinnitus exacerbation. We can have also some unbalanced feelings. All those we can assess with a simple test that anybody can do at the clinic. And if we are performing any maneuver treatment for VPPV, we always want to do that test first to assess. Besides assessing the artery, we're also assessing the neck range of motion, how much does the head move in order for us to have a specific position. If we can see that our patient, the range of motion for the head is only this, okay, whole pike, we have to be careful. We're doing sideline, we have to be careful. When we are doing the airplane maneuver, if we're choosing that one, has to be extra cool because the head is only turning less than 45 degree angle. So for my opinion, the best choice to go is sideline. And we go sideline again, we're going on the side. Again, the head is not reaching 45 degrees. So what do we do? We use the shoulder, push the shoulder back. And that's when we reach the position that we want. And all that we need to assess neck range of motion before laying your person flat or on the side, always to avoid any further complications. Thank you. You're welcome. All righty. Um, Abraham, anything else you want to add to this? Um, that's another thing that I would like to add to this. I asked the American Institute of Balance for some of the videos. Uh, you guys saw it before. And they also wanted me to tell you guys that they're performing some online workshop only for international people. And um, if you guys are interested, you can send me a text or an email. You guys have my number in the group so I can contact them and give you like a discount for, for the workshop they're preparing. But this workshop will be only for international people, it's not for American people. Perfect. That's really great to know that there's a access to such a resource available. Um, you know, Vertigo's, Imbalance, dizziness is a is a complex uh, subject for a lot of us because you know we're not you know we're really not interested in it. We're only interested in you know those things that we can understand. And I think it's really important for us to take the time to pay attention to the dizzy patient and to find a way that we can within our own practice assess the patients so that we have a good feeling for what their problem is. And, you know, if you live in Asuncion, you know, fortunately you have access to somebody like Abraham who, you know, you refer the patient, they're going to give you a, a, you know, they're going to give you a clinical answer as to what's going on with the patient. Um, for those of you that do not have the uh, resources, um, of a person like Abraham, you know, you're, you're kind of like, you know, you're going to have to use more clinical judgment than you are, you know, testing procedures to help you figure it out. Um, I believe Roman in Ukraine has a lot of capabilities. He studied in London um, at U, UCI and did a year of audiology. Roman, if you're joining us today, um, do you have any comments that you want to share with us as to what you do in Ukraine? Uh, <clears throat> hi, thanks for, for the lecture. It's, uh, it was really interesting to listen to it and to watch the videos. Uh, I mean, we, I did study at the UCL Ear Institute in London, but, and we had a separate module even on balance. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see, I mean, I see patients with the dizziness, vertigo, and things like that, uh, but I don't don't have a lot of experience in uh, various position testing. But we have a neurologist who works with us, and he has all the you know diagnostic uh, equipment for that he uses in his routine practice. So whenever we have any doubts or we need um, another doctor for you know differential diagnosis, then we refer patients with the. Uh, BPPV or vertigo or dizziness. Also, we also consult them always with the with a neurologist. 
sometimes if we see that we need you know things like uh, evoke potentials then we can do those as well but you know uh, it's quite an interesting topic and uh, there isn't m there isn't many outside there for rec for you know ENT doctors to use in daily practice but as I know more ev more and more for example applications for cell phones uh, appear online that you can use and they're free which help you in your routine medical practice to see what's you know what ha what's happening with the patient and help you in your daily practice great thanks for your comments uh, thomas uh is in uh latvia no lithuania thomas if you're there and you can hear me uh do you have any comments about what you guys do in your hospital there in uh Lithuania. I'm not sure Thomas is hearing me. Let's see here. Okay. Uh, hi. Yes. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Hi, Thomas. Hi. I was just wondering if you could make some comments about what you do in uh, in Lithuania. Yeah, we have a we have a doctor who specializes in 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 vertigo diagnostics, and we also have a neurologist who also does that. So they both do all the tests. I don't usually see those patients also, so. Right. Um, it's usually just the emergency room patients, but it's like bedside tests that I can do only. Right, and then you give them Valium or another anti-emetic uh, and vestibular yeah. uh, suppressant so that you can uh, have them see a neurologist in the morning. You know, I think another thing is um, in countries that like uh, in the United States, there's really little interest, or let's put it this way, there's more interest today than there was in the past of, of doing vestibular testing by ENT doctors for one simple reason. Anything that can be done to generate a test and you can bill an insurance company has become very popular, very popular. I know a friend of mine in Lima, Peru, who's a ENT doctor, he specializes only in vestibular. Well, his, he has a big interest in vestibular disorders. Um, he's taking courses throughout South America. And I believe, you know, he's very motivated by his interest in vestibular disorders. But I know also that the fact that he can generate a, a bill for an insurance company or a patient also has some motivating factor. So, um, you know, I think it, I think the real truth of the matter is in most most countries, unless the doctor is got an interest in it from an academic point of view, we're going to see people like Abraham that are going to be part of our team and help us to uh, come up with a, the diagnosis, let alone a differential diagnosis as to what, um, you know, what the patient's experiencing and, you know, what the probability is as to the etiology. Um, I think I've got a, and I'll put it on the WhatsApp website. I think it's, there's like a, it's called the five minute neurologic exam or something like that. Let me, let me see if I can find it. I'll link it to everybody if I can find it. Um, I think it will complement some of the things that Abraham has uh, added today. There's no doubt about it. The vestibular system is beyond complex. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the interaction between the, vestibular nerve, the abducens nerve, uh, you know, contralateral, ipsilateral. Um, and as Abraham said, you know, we, we're dealing with uh, gravity from the semicircular canals. And um, I think it's linear movement from the uh, vestibule, vestibule. So again, they're, they're pretty complex. Uh, it's a complex subject. So if you're dizzy from this lecture, uh, join me in that. Um, I'd like to thank Abraham, unless there's any further questions, I'd like to thank Abraham for sharing some of his uh, experience with us. Um, any, any further questions, please let me know. Otherwise, um, we will say have a good weekend, everybody. Uh, you'll get some updates from me for what's going on next week. And um, Abraham is on our platform. So anytime you have a question about a dizzy patient, feel free to you know, connect with him. Uh, he's an un, uh, he's a invaluable resource for for people like um, myself who you know really are more interested in surgical treatment 
of chronic ear disease. So, um, Richard. Yes. Uh -huh. I, I I work with Abraham, and he tried to teach tried to teach me how to treat the DC patients, but I got lazy because I got him. So I I send all the patients to him. That's right. You know, when you when you have somebody like him, you don't need to learn much. You just rely on them. All right. Well, listen, I'm still let's, trying. I'm still trying. Okay. All right. Listen again. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, you have a pleasant weekend. Uh, any comments or please put them on the uh, on the platform on, on WhatsApp. And stay safe. And stay healthy. Okay. Good talking to everybody. Good night. Have a good good night or good evening. <laughs>